Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Marcel, for the introduction. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here, and in particular, Marcel. Thank you very, very much. Um, as you can see, the title I've been given to, uh, by the organizers um, is the transcriptomics as a tool to diagnose doping manipulation. But I'd like to widen it a little bit, as you can see here, an integrative omic solution to EPO, and I'll explain during my talk what I mean by that. But I'd like to start off with how big the problem may be, because we're here at FIFA House today with regards to um, football, and it's very, very difficult, as we already heard, to, to utilize positive tests to say how big the problem is. And there was this review going back in 2008, um, which alludes to this issue, and you probably all know this review very well, but so I won't dwell on it, but just dwell on this box here, which says that the, uh, the few and annually decreasing positive tests only represent the tip of, the, uh, of a much larger iceberg. That is what was stated in 2008, and in this paper, it uh, talks about some indirect evidence from uh, managers like Arsene Wenger and so on, but again, I won't dwell on that. That was 2008. Now, 2013, only a few weeks ago, again, you're probably all aware of this, um, uh, what came out in the media in Belgium, and what they did was they asked about 100 professional football players, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry about all this text on the slide, I just wanted to show you the source, um, and they asked 100 professional football players uh, who are active in the top flight um, a number of questions, and you can see the four questions here. A, I have witnessed players use doping, but I never tried it myself. I know that banned substances are being used in the top flight. Or C, I don't think doping is being used in top flight. And what's interesting from the results, if you can see here, that 24 players chose option B, which is I know that banned substances are being used. Uh, and four players, A, I have witnessed players using doping. Now, that data is, is compelling and quite different Clearly, it's not scientific data per se, not published in a journal, but very different to what positive tests are telling us. So what is right? I don't know. So what are the EPO uh, tests that, that are being used? And um, again, we've heard a lot of, of, of this already, and this audience, you know this better than I do. And clearly, there are direct approaches, which we heard in the previous speaker, and also the indirect approaches, in particular, the athlete biological passport, which has clearly um, improved the specificity and sensitivity as compared to previous methods. That we know. Um, at the same time, however, there have been studies like this one led by, uh, by uh, Michael Ashenden and, and Chris Gore, who had difficulties showing um, this approach to detect uh, microdose EPO doping. And we clearly know this is what athletes are now doing. So that is a problem, uh, hence my question to Marcel early on. So what can we do? Well, I hope I can convince you today that a strategy is what we're calling an integrative omics approach. And that is what I want to focus my, my talk on today. So what is omics? And again, I apologize for those of you who, who know what omics is, but just in case you don't, um, omics refers to all of these different omics. The first one, genomics, which is what can happen. The second one, transcriptomics, is what appears to happen, and that's looking at uh, messenger RNA. Um, proteomics, what makes it happen, so the whole proteome, rather look at one or two proteins. And thirdly, the metabolome, all the metabolites. Now for today's presentation, I'm going to focus solely on one of those omics, the transcriptomics um, of these omics, had I had three hours, I would have actually gone on to some of the others, because thanks to WADA, we've been funded to look at a number of this, these different omics, and we heard in one of the earlier presentations as well, possibility of using microRNA as well. I don't have time to talk about those. I'm going to focus, however, on the one of, of these omics, which has produced, I think, the, by far the most compelling potential um, to solve some of these problems or to deal with some of these problems. I also want to mention, just before I, I, I go off the slide, the importance of bioinformatics and collecting um, and utilizing uh, the knowledge of each of these different omics to integrate the whole story and also to measure the phenotype. And from the phenotype, it could be the typical, uh, typically used hematological parameters that we all know very well. So that is what I refer to omics. Um, we 
we had this idea to, do, to try this approach back in 2006. Um, we tried a, a few years to get some funding. Eventually, uh, in 2008, we were funded for, uh, our first study was funded uh, in collaboration with uh, my dear friend Gunther Gmeiner, who I was hoping to see here. Um, and I thank him very much for his interaction um, uh, in, in doing this research as well. Um, and we were funded for the obvious two areas here as far as the project categories. And what were the main hypotheses? Um, and you can see them here. One, to measure blood parameters, so the typical blood parameters that we all know, but also gene expression profiles in sea level as well as altitude adapted trained athletes after EPO administration. And let me just be very clear here, these were indeed trained athletes who were not permitted to compete uh, while during, during the study and for a significant time thereafter. The second aim was to determine the effects of ethnicity on metallurgical parameters and gene expression. So what difference does, does, let me use the term race quite loosely here. And thirdly, formulate revised methods with improved discriminatory power relative to standard methods. And that's really what our target has been going right back to 2006, 2008. Where do you conduct these kind of demanding projects? Because you need to do them at two different altitudes. This is the uh, slide from the shuttle radar topography mission um, where color coding reflects topographical height. Um, the lighter color uh, reflects uh, high altitude. So areas of white are particularly interesting to us because these are areas of high altitude. Um, so we had to consider that. But also what we wanted to consider is where do most of the best distance runners come from because clearly uh, uh, in, uh, EPO is a, is, a, is a drug that has been abused to enhance, in particular, endurance, although there's also other reasons to take it. Um, so where do the best athletes in the world live and train? Well, it's this region of Kenya. Um, I know there's been a recent reshuffling of this, uh, or the different classification of the regions, but I'm gonna use this loosely as the Nandi region of Kenya, where most of these athletes live and train. And I've had the, um, the pleasure for over a decade to study what makes these athletes so amazing, but that's a different topic. Um, and at the same time, this region is also the mecca for distance running. When you go to one of the, 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 the main tracks uh, in this area, you'll find most of the world's distance runners living and training in that region, or at least at some point in their career um, or during the season, they'll go and train there. So very briefly, um, what we did, um, and this is the design. We started off, as I said to you, with um, 20 uh, sea level athletes. These were based in Glasgow in Scotland, um, and 20 East Africans based in Eldoret in Kenya um, at roughly 2,400, 2,500 meters. This is the protocol. Each athlete had to go through this process. It lasted 10 weeks, two weeks baseline, uh, four weeks of EPO administration. How much EPO did we give? Uh, the doses that were typical of the 90s, possibly um, 50 international units per kg uh, for four weeks um, every two days, and then uh, four weeks of no injections. Um, at the same time, as you can see here, we collected samples for a whole series of different things. This project started us in 2008, and it's gonna be ongoing for possibly a number of years. Because we collected blood parameters, we collected saliva, a different topic maybe for another day, and also uh, urine as well. Um, so that's what we did. Um, at the same time, at baseline, at the end of the EPO phase, and right at the end of the study, we also did physical performance tests. And I'm just gonna start off with that before I show you the, the more interesting data. Um, what we did was it's called VO2 max testing, which is testing the aerobic capacity of these athletes. Um, this is uh, the testing in Glasgow. This is our uh, water supported lab in Kenya. Um, what did we find? And some of you will have seen the publication already. We published this in PLOS One. Um, um, the solid circles are the Scottish cohort, the open squares are Kenya. Um, and you can see that the Kenyans have, have clearly got a higher VO2 max than the Scottish athletes, but they both improve um, as a result of EPO and then at the end of four weeks of no injections, they're still higher than normal. Um, and if you want to see the change that you get, whether you're at altitude or not altitude, you can see it's not too dissimilar. Average year in Kenya was 6% improvement. 
and about 9% improvement in Scotland. That is VO2 max test. But no one goes to the Olympic to compete in the VO2 max test. Um, what they do is performance. What about performance? We looked at a 3,000 meter time trial um, in the Kelvin Arena in Glasgow, or this track here, the Chip Kalel track, which is the track where most of these athletes live and tra or train. Um, and we wanted to do this because this paper that I know some of you will have read, if not all of you, really annoyed us. Annoyed us because they were saying that, well, what is the real efficacy of EPO? Does it really enhance performance? Well, I'll let you decide for yourselves if they were indeed correct. But before I do that, let me just show you how we did the test. Just also, well, if this works, if it doesn't, I'll bypass it. Oh, it's a shame, it won't run. Anyway, you would have seen the, the athletes doing the test um, on this track, but don't worry about that. Okay. So, so what did um, uh, we find? Um, again, the, the symbols, as I said to you previously, clearly the Kenyans are much faster than the Scottish um, athletes. As a result of EPO, you can see the improvement, um, and that improvement is still maintained, and these were trained athletes, still maintained four weeks after the last injection. If you want to look at a percentage improvement, uh, you can see here in Scotland about 6%, in Kenya about 5% on average. Clearly EPO works, hence they use it. Um, so clearly we can reject this, and I think we should probably write back to the journal and, and, and tell them that they shouldn't have published this. Anyway, um, as far as the blood analysis, which is really what you're interested in, um, uh, we did the, the typical hematological parameters that we've been hearing about using a seismic uh, device. Um, and Marshall and others know the kind of difficulties getting a machine like this to altitude and running it and all the rest. Uh, but that's, again, something we can discuss over dinner maybe. Um, the parameters, um, again, this is weeks on this axis. This is hematocrit. Um, the gray bit is the EPO phase. And nothing here that you'd be too surprised about. Clearly, the Kenyans have higher hematocrit than the, the, Scot the Scottish athletes. Um, but, and they go up. But what is interesting is that they don't go up in parallel. You can see that there's some kind of feedback mechanism because in Kenya they are plateauing or achieving similar levels to what is eventually achieved with EPO um, in Scotland. And then they come down at slightly different rates. The next slides, because I know we've, we've got difficulty with time, um, hemoglobin, almost the, the exact image of that, but you would expect that, so I won't dwell on that. Um, uh, the next one is uh, reticulocytes, which is particularly interesting because they both start with similar levels here on average about one. But note that in Kenya, at the uh, two weeks after the injection to the highest point, it's only starting to get at two. So clearly you can be well below this value here and have uh, beneficial effects and not be considered suspicious, but that's again a different issue. Uh, note how in Scotland that the values are going bigger, so the change it seems to be bigger at sea level rather than altitude. But overall, the pattern is similar. Okay, so what did we do? In all these kind of studies, I think it's very important that you collect samples for every possibility for the future, because doing the studies are difficult and time-consuming and costly. And for today's presentation, as I said to you, I'm going to focus only on gene expression, but we are set up, this biobank exists, to do all the different omics, and we are doing these. Um, but I'm going to focus today only on this rather than microRNA or other things. Um, because of game costs, the, uh, especially going back a few years ago now, uh, these uh, arrays are very expensive, so we decided, just as a proof of principle, to go two baselines, three during, and three post-EPO. Um, and that's what I'm going to show you today. Um, and I'm going to develop the data so you all follow uh, what we found. Um, and this is starting off in Scotland. Uh, I'm going to show you data from 18 individuals. Uh, this is the baseline sample, and we're going to use um, a greater than one and a half fold change as our statistical uh, threshold for saying something is happening, okay? So that is what I'm going to use. So this is now uh, two days after the first injection. So after one injection of EPO, um, what are we seeing? 41 genes are significantly different, with 41 greater uh, in, in going, going in up, being upregulated, zero going down. Now that is, I think, particularly exciting. 41 after the one single injection. Um, what happens after doing this for two weeks? Um, 811 genes are significantly different. 
And by the way, if I were to reduce this cutoff to 1.4, 1.3, 1.2, which I could easily do, this number becomes massive. That's how it potentially uh, sensitive this method is. Uh, 736 go up, 75 go down. What happens after four weeks now of injections? Uh, 394 uh, different, 390 go up, four go down. The fact that we're having genes going in different directions also excites our bioinformaticists who are trying to get a diagnostic test out of this, um, and for obvious maybe reasons. And the overlap is 41 here, um, and this is a typical Venn diagram that one could use. Um, that's during, and you may say, well, that's fine, Yanis, but we already can use the EPO methods that we heard previously to detect EPO. This doesn't help us. You want to know what happens after, don't you? Um, but before I do that, just to show you what happens in Kenya, and because of time, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, you will record that the changes were somewhat less big, um, but here we have overlap about 60 genes now, and if we look at those 60 versus those 41, here we do there, there's 32 that are overlapping. And clearly those are the first 32 that we, will, we are working towards as the diagnostic test. But as I said to you, this is during EPO. So maybe not too exciting, although very sensitive to EPO. What you really want to know what happens post. Same criteria, and I think I'm really going to excite you if I haven't already. Um, now, this is two weeks after the last injection. Not one day, five days, two weeks after the last EPO injection. And what you'll see, 249 genes are still significantly different. Seven up, 242 down. Now, the real optimist in the audience said, this is fabulous, but what happens four weeks? Well, 139 genes are still different. And I do think this is probably the most exciting data I've had the pleasure to work with. Um, the overlap is 135 if you put those two together. Uh, if you look at Kenya, I'll remind you the changes weren't as dramatic, but we're still finding 31 uh, overlapping here. Uh, and if we overlap the 31 with a 135, there are the 30. Combined with the previous ones that we found during EPO, and then we start developing our array, focusing on those particular genes, a possibility of a diagnostic test, one would argue. Michelle has already explained this very well. You all know this very well, how you can look at an athlete who's possibly clean, an athlete here who clearly wasn't. Um, uh, and that is the biological passport as we know it. But as you've already alluded to, there are problems with this because how, how, how many athletes are getting away with it? And just to show you the kind of patterns of these genes, because I've been showing you these Van diagrams, but not the patterns of the genes. Um, and this is looking at, uh, this is a log ratio scale of one particular gene, and it's just a typical one of these genes. Um, the color coding here, Scotland is in green, and, and red is the Kenyans. Um, and look what happens. This is going up during the, the EPO phase. You can see the change here, that's threefold change. And that's a log scale. So these effects are quite dramatic. And note, ladies and gentlemen, during the EPO or afterwards, everyone is doing the same thing. And it's just one gene. This is, I think, is quite remarkable. Um, so this is the biological passport as we know it. But an integrative omics solution be one where you don't throw away the good things of the past. Clearly the biological passport is a fantastic advancement. We heard some of the strengths of it and we know the strengths of it. But when we go and combine, so you don't throw out the previous things that worked, but you start combining one, two, three, 32, 100, 120 genes, what are we then able to do? And we've been fortunate uh, last year, we, we got funded to, because in one sense this is all great, but, and you, but what happens with the, what now athletes are doing, which are taking microdoses? And we are currently doing that. Um, and at the same time, looking at other confounders, like we heard earlier on, the effects of exercise. We know, for example, it's, it's, big, it's problematic to wait for two hours before you do a, a, an assessment of an athlete post-competition. But these, these uh, parameters I'm going to show you are very, very robust. You could do the measurements immediately, or you need to know what are the effects of exercise. So this year, we've been funded to also look at the effects of exercise in addition to um, uh, the microdoses. So what are we doing? Just very, very, and I can't present you any data because we're halfway through the study, but just to excite you, it's looking at microdoses now. Um, also, this time we're using um, a placebo uh, 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 control. So basically, we have EPO uh, and we have a placebo. 
Um, and, we, and we're now utilizing a, a standard or one of the standard microdosing protocols. At the same time, we want to know, well, if EPO is being used in team sports, how does it work? And also, is exercise and training um, a real confounder? Well, to do that, we've also added uh, a typical test used in, in games like football, um, high intensity. This is the sprint test that we use. So before EPO, at the end of the EPO phases, they're doing these uh, six seconds on, 30 seconds off, 10 repeated sprints. You can see the power outputs here. This is data from the pre-phase. I don't have the post-phase to show you and looking at how EPO could possibly work. Um, once we have the data, I think it will hopefully convince us that this is the way to go. There's still some uncertainties. Can we reproduce this microdoses? What are the confounders? I didn't talk about altitude. We need to differentiate the effects of altitude. And also we heard earlier on about transfusions. And there is some data showing that the similar approach has produced some interesting gene expression profiles along these lines from wider funded research. So if you combine the confounders of exercise, the confounder of altitude, the confounder, or if you want to actually detect it, transfusions, you may, this is the approach I think you'll need to be, that, that will produce the result. But I, have, I, I need to generate that, that data to, be, to convince you. If that works, I think we can possibly use this for other uh, substances that are problematic for good reasons, as we heard, like growth hormone. Um, and we actually did apply for funding this year from WADA, and I, I think they, right, they were right to reject us. They would reject us because they said, well, let's see how the, the EPO work uh, goes first before we pursue that. And I can understand that. Um, so, to end off, what have I showed you today? Well, I've showed you a hope that we've, that we've produced the first molecular signature of EPO doping, um, although having seen some, uh, a, a previous wider funded report, the genes that we found and what they submitted a few years ago are almost identical. So, can I really say we were the first? I'd like to say that probably we weren't. Um, but at least confirms previous findings. These results provide the strongest evidence to date that omics techniques such as gene expression have the potential to add a new dimension to currently applied ABP um, in terms of persistence sensitivity for drug detection, not to confine to EPO. So other drugs as well, the difficult ones, the hundred different type of EPO related drugs. Um, and the very encouraging results serve to strongly reinforce the feasibility and the need for this complex, expensive to do at the research stage and technically demanding approach. We heard early on, um, uh, Professor Dvorak, about jointly doing things. Well, maybe instead of having to only do things in succession, because WADA are having to finance this in a heavy way, maybe funding from other organizations to jointly proceed to, to, uh, with this kind of work in a more rapid way. I'm clearly trying to lobby here. Um, at the same time, I'm just a spokesman of this excellent team of collaborators from around the world who have really helped us in this. Um, and just only a very few of the names are here. Um, there's a lot of steering co committee members, uh, some in the audience, some not here. But I want to stress two individuals who are really the, the who have done the heroic work here. Um, Jerome Jerusel, um, who's from Switzerland, um, and Rizabashu Haile is from Ethiopia. And I'm very pleased that this year at the American College of Sports Medicine, which has two student awards, they both got the awards for their wider funded research. And that just shows you um, uh, the possibility, hopefully, anyway, of that, the, that this work can really produce the results we all want to produce. Um, and at that point, I'll stop and I'll thank you very much for your attention.